Blog Talk Radio. Me chiamo Afura Kanu Afura Kaitnut Neye Akanfo Nana Song Da Me Dinde O Girafo Kwesi Ra Nehmpata Akan Akwamu Main Amaruka Etifi Mu O Girafo O Giramain Mu Greetings to all Afura Kani Afura Kaitnut people, many Africans, black people today. It's Akanfo Nana Song Day, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion day. My name is O Girafo Kwesi Ra Nehmpata Akan. Ojira for the Akwamu Nation in North America, within Ojira Ma, the purified nation, Akurakani, Akuraikaitni, people in the Western Hemisphere. Did I say we thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. If you have any questions or comments and you'd like to interact in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, uh, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. For those who are new to the broadcast, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akanfo Nana Som, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion on Joda Monday nights, where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of Nana Som Ancestral Religion. First and foremost, because we are Akan. Secondly, because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan cosmology, religion, ritual practice, and so forth, not only from individuals uh, in the Western Hemisphere, but also on the continent of Apuraka, Apuraikai, those who who have been uh, infected with white culture, pseudo-religion, pseudo-religious practices, fictional cartoon characters who never existed, such as Jesus, Yeshua, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Solomon, Shiva, Menelik, Muhammad, Allah, Yahweh, Buddha, Brahman, and so forth. So those who've been infected promote an infected presentation of ancestral religion. So we deal with ancient, authentic, Akan ancestral religion, which deals with our ancestral origins from the ancient Kanat, the Khan land, which was a title of ancient Nubia people, originated in that region, migrated west after the fall of ancient Kemet in northern Kanat, Egypt and northern Nubia. 2,000 years ago, we reestablished ourselves in the western part of the continent, reestablished the Kanat Empire, the Nubian Empire, called the Ghana Empire. Hundreds of years subsequent to that, some of our people migrated further south to reestablish themselves in the forest belt regions and savannah regions of today's Ghana and Ivory Coast, and centuries subsequent to that migration and resettlement, some of our people were forced from those regions into North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Kessie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. However, we maintained our ancestral religious practices upon our forced migration. Thus, Akan ancestry religion is called Winti in Suriname, South America, from the Akan term Quinti. Akan ancestry religion is called Obia in Jamaica, from the Akan term Obai. Akan ancestry religion is called Hoodoo in the United States, from the Akan term Undu, meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life. It also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession, spirit communication. And we have shown in our book, Who Do People, that these same terms can be found in the language of ancient Kemet and Kanat. In the Medutu, in the hieroglyphs, you'll find that Undu means medicine from roots, trees, plant life. Undu means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession, spirit communication. Undu is also the uh, offerings we give at the shrines of the deities and ancestral spirits. Those offerings are called the Undu, and the shrines themselves are called Undu shrines as well. A title of ancient Nubia is the Undu land and the people, the Undu people. So we deal with this ancient, authentic Akan ancestry religion on Joda Monday nights, dealing with cosmology, culture, ritual practice from a purified perspective. On Benada, Abenada Tuesday nights, we have Ujira, which means purification. In that broadcast, we deal with ancestral relig- religion in general, not just the Akan expression but ancestral religion in general and how it impacts every aspect of our lives as Akurakani, Akurakani people, African black people, wherever we exist in the world. Akurakani, Akurakani, or African ancestral religion, which we call Nanasom in general, in essence is defined.
defined as the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and thus realign ourselves with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance, these are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. We state that Ujira purification operationalizes Nanasong. Purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating law and ritually restoring balance so that we can align every thought, every intention, and every action, every moment of every day with divine order. Our culture is Akurakani, Akurakani people, is the divine law, love, or acceptance of order, and the divine rejection, hatred of disorder, and its purveyors. We seek to execute our divine function in creation. When we make legitimate mistakes, we engage the ritual process to incorporate law and restore balance, and therefore we can realign every thought, every intention, every action, every moment of every day with divine order. That is our way of life as Afurakani, Afurakani people. So this is how ancestral religion impacts every aspect of our lives. So we deal with the purification of concepts, purification of cosmology, purification of ritual practice, the knowledge of the divinities, forces in creation, the ancestresses and ancestors and so forth, we show how when we incorporated ancestral religion, maintained our ancestral religious practices in our blood circles through spirit genetic inheritance, maintaining our ancestral religious practices here in the Western Hemisphere, is those of our people who engaged that process, who were guided and empowered by the ancestresses and ancestors and the deities on the best means by which to wage war against the whites and their offspring massacre the whites and their offspring and force the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. So it is through our ancestral religious practices that we become grounded. It impacts every aspect of our lives, and we deal with that on the Ojira broadcast. On Egua Marketplace Day, which is Akua Da, Awuku Da, Wednesday night, we have Egua Marketplace. What we deal with is Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, those who are serving the Afurakani, Afurakani community in a positive capacity, those who are maintaining their ancestral religious values in the context of their service to the community. So we've showcased a number of businesses, organizations, and institutions. We also deal with the philosophical foundation of economic development rooted in our ancestral religious values and holistic approach to economic development for Afurakani, Afurakani people, we have published our document, Okom Economic Development Model, which details that approach. And within that process, we have our operation, starve the beast and feed the pride. That means you make an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds you would have potentially wasted with the whites and their offspring. Then you starve the beast and feed the pride. You reallocate those funds away from the white businesses and direct them to the business organization or institution of the week. We showcase one Afurakani, Afurakani business organization or institution per week for optimal capital infusion. Thus, when you shift those resources from the white business to the black business organization or institution of the week, you shift $10 away from a white business to a black business, that is a shift, a transfer of $10 of capital. When a 1,000 people are on the same page, they starve the beast and feed the pride on a weekly basis, then that's $10,000 being shifted away from white businesses, from our absolute enemies, to an Afurakani or Afurakani business or organization or institution that empowers them to hire permanently and full-time within the business from people within the community that allows them to expand their products and services to us and serve us at a greater capacity. If we do not engage in this process, on a consistent basis, then by default, we leave that $10,000 plus and ultimately hundreds of billions of dollars in the hands of our absolute enemies, the whites and their offspring. And by default, we are financing our own oppression. 
So what we need to understand is we must starve the beast and feed the prophet. So hold on one second. We just want to make sure uh, it's the notes that we're receiving. So if you have any, uh, once again, if you have any questions or comments on the phone line, hit the number one. If you um, need to get into the chat room, you must log in as a user. If you don't have a username, you can log in or you can sign up for a username quickly in Blog Talk so that you can interact in the chat room. Our broadcast on Yada Thursday night is Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation. In the Amain Sim broadcast, we, sh- we deal with Amaniye, nationism, the purification of nationalism. We deal with nation building from a purified perspective and ancestral religious values perspective. We deal with issues that are confronting our people and how we address those issues from a nationist perspective. And, of course, we dealt with this um, um, in detail, of course, this past Awusida Sunday at our Ojidama and Afashe event, our conference, third annual conference. Of course, we want to say Yerase to everyone who came out to the conference. It was a great event. We had a great exchange of information. The presenters all did a great job, of course. Everybody received the information well. Um, we also had our vendors at our Egwa marketplace did well as well, serving community, empowering the community and so forth, and they themselves being empowered. So we appreciate everyone who came out. We were able to give away a free copy of our new book, Ojirama Afashe, 13,018, to everyone who attended the event, as we do at all of our events. Our events are free. Um, our presentations, our conferences, presentations around the country, these are free events. And then we also have, uh, we give away a free copy of one of our books, specifically the book that we're presenting on. We give away a free copy of that to everyone who attends the free event. So that was a great event. Get out there once again for everyone coming out to support that event. But on the Amai and Sim broadcast, this is what we deal with, uh, dealing with our issues from an Amaniye perspective, a nationist perspective. We have a proper understanding of what an Omine or a nation is, a an Omayan, a nation, in the true sense, is a living, breathing entity governed by specific forces in creation. We are cells within that organal structure, and just as the cells interface with one another harmoniously in, in the organ of which they are component part, but they support the organ itself and its energy complex itself, we are cells within an organal structure, which is an Omayan, a nation, a living, breathing entity that is governed by specific Abosom, Marisha, Vodou, and so forth, we harmonize with the forces in creation that regulate and administrate the affairs of the Omai, the entity of which we're component parts, and we interface with one another harmoniously. Although we were forced into the Western Hemisphere, at some point we were directed by our ancestresses and ancestors to coalesce in the specific region of the Earth Mother's body here in the West, blend ancestral blood circles, learn how to interface with the unique expression of the Aboso Marisha Vodou, the deities, the Ntoru, Ntoru as they manifest in this region of the Earth Mother, Earth Mother's body, interface with the Earth Mother divinities, Asase Apu and Asasiya, in this region of their body, interface with plant life, animal life, mineral life, physically for food and medicine, as well as through the spirit totems of plant life, animal life, and mineral life as they manifest in this region of the Earth Mother's body. And therefore, that confluence of activity has allowed us to forge a locative identity, a unique expression of Afurakani, Afurakani culture, that is an ancestral religious practice that is unique to us. So we solve our problems in our unique fashion. We express ourselves in our own unique fashion. We're not dependent on anyone outside of our ancestral blood circles, spirit genetic blood circles, for our ancestral religious practice, initiations nor our approach to nation. It is all taken care of within our clans as we have developed here in the Western Hemisphere. So that's what we deal with on the Amain Sim broadcast. And once again, we released the book, Ojiraman Afashe, the journal for the conference um, that was released on the day of the conference this past Awusida Sunday. The ebook version has been placed on the website. Soft cover version is available as well. That is our 31st book. All 31 of our books are free downloads from our website. The soft cover versions range between $8 and $11, so you can access those as well. All right. So 
Uh, tonight we wanted to um, touch on the Noob New Beat Rejuvenation or Rejuvenation Retreat that we are hosting in California, in Folsom, California. We want to deal with the cosmology of Ra and Heheru. We just uh, posted this uh, retreat, this information about this retreat, just posted this new page today. So you're just getting it today because we just posted it today. Now, some of you are aware that we've had two retreats this year. This is um, of 13,018. Our year, of course, begins at the Atem Atem Equinox, the Autumn Equinox. September 22nd was the first day of the Equinox, the balancing point, the second balancing point, or first balancing point of the year. And that was the end of the harvest time, but the beginning of the seeding time, and that is our New Year, um, New Year's Day, the fall equinox. So September 22nd was the first day of 13,018 for our, our for Aquamu Mine, Amarukai Tifi Mu, the Aquamu Nation in North America. Um, this year coming up in on September 23rd, that will be the first full day of the equinox. That will be our New Year's Day, September 23rd. That will be our first day of our new year of 13,019. So we only have a few months left until September 23rd, meaning a few months left. We have, a, a, in fact, less than a three months left in our year of 13,018. Uh, the last day of 13,018 for us is September 22nd. And September 23rd will be the first day of 13,019. So we've had two retreats this year. This is the first time that we have done retreats. We typically do our, we have our conferences throughout the year. We have the Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival in October, three weeks after our New Year's Day. So October, um, middle October, we have the Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival, which is our kind of ancestral religion in North America, that Hudu is our kind of ancestral religion in North America. In March, around the spring equinox, we have Echi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion, where we deal with ancestral religious practices, not just Hudu, but also, which is the Akan tradition, but Juju, which is the Yoruba tradition in North America, preserved in our blood circles. Voodoo, which is the Eve and Phone tradition in North America, preserved in our blood circles. Voodoo, um, Juju is the Yoruba tradition. Eve and phone tradition is Voodoo. Wanga is the Ovambo tradition preserved in our blood circles. And Gengain is the Fang tradition. Grigri is the Bambara tradition and so forth. So those traditions from different groups who maintain these traditions for hundreds of years here in North America in our blood circles intergenerationally and transcarnationally, those are the traditions that we um, represent and inform our people about and have different presenters come out from around the country presenting on these traditions. So that's at the spring equinox. Then in um, around the summer solstice, around June 21st, 23rd, 24th, we have our Ujidamain Afashe Purified Nation Akurakani Akurakani People in the Western Hemisphere Conference where we deal with nation building from a purified perspective from an nationist perspective and Amaniye perspective and so forth. So, and we just had that, as we said, just this past weekend. So we've had our conferences three years in a row, the third annual of each one of these conferences, the fourth annual Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival is coming up in October. Um, but this year was the first time we had specifically retreats where we left and went to a specific location to um, engage ritually, but also we call them training, cultural, and ritual retreats based on Oberima and Dobatine, Apurakani manhood, Apurakani womanhood, in the context of culture, nation building, ancestral religion, and so forth. So we had our Hapi Merit uh, hibernation retreat in February in South Carolina on Edisto Island, one of the Gullah Islands in South Carolina. And of course, that's um, on, along the ocean and so forth. South Carolina was one of the major ports where our people were uh, forced to come into the Western Hemisphere 
during the enslavement era, but it was also one of those areas, the Gullah Islands, where our people waged war against the whites and their offspring and freed themselves from enslavement. So we went to that sacred ancestral settlement and had our Hapi Merit retreat, hibernation retreat, dealing with purification and so forth, becoming grounded in Obedima, Afrakani manhood, Afrakani womanhood, and so forth, based on our books of the same title, so that our people can leave these retreats and go out and teach this information and inform the community and empower the community on another level. So we had that um, in South Carolina in February. In May, around Memorial Day weekend, we had our Ka Kaet Soul of Hoodoo and Voodoo retreat with Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau, myself and Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau. Of course, Happy Merit was myself and Dr. Ia Ajua conducted that retreat. In uh, New Orleans, Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau and myself conducted that retreat. She's based in New Orleans. And we dealt with Hoodoo and Voodoo, but also Obedima and Obatan, Afrakaini. Afrakani manhood, Afrakani womanhood, strengthening um, those bonds, strengthening that understanding and foundation because the strong foundation of Afrakani men and Afrakani women is the foundation of strong families and the bearing of strong children and the foundation of nation building from a purified perspective and ancestral religious values perspective. So that was a great retreat. We had that in, in May um, in New Orleans. That's New Orleans, of course, is a major port in the South where our people were forced into uh, enslavement, but also where we waged war and freed ourselves from enslavement and established independent sovereign settlements and so forth. So that was another sacred ancestral um, settlement that we went to, paid homage to our ancestors and ancestors and built, you know, um, culturally and ritually and so forth, rebuilding ourselves, reestablishing our own mind, our nation. And now we're going to the west, to the extreme west in the western hemisphere, which is California, and we just put this information out. This will be the final retreat of 13,018 for us. Yes, for some, you know that we are having a retreat in November, at the end of November into December in Jamaica, but of course that is for us, that goes right into our year 13,019. But our, our year 13,018 ends, as we said, in September, this September. So this is the last retreat um, of, of our year. The next one in the United States will be in February, the Happy Merit Retreat in February. So this one coming up is the last one. It will be in September. So when you go to the new page and we – We'll put the link in the chat room for the new page. Uh, just give me one second. All right. And just give me one more second. We'll pull this information up. Okay. So when you go to the new page, you see, see it says noob, new beats. Rejuve Nation or Rejuvenation Retreat, Folsom, California, September 8th and 9th, that's Saturday and Sunday, that, that particular weekend. Then it says Obedima and Oba Tain, Afurakani Manhood and Afurakani Womanhood Training, Cultural and Ritual Retreat. Now, we're going to get into some detail about some true story, get into some detail about uh, some cosmology, uh, but first and foremost, why do we use this uh, terminology for noob and new beat, and why are we going to the West? So we state that in our ancestral language of ancient Kanit and Kemet, the terms noob and new beat are the masculine and feminine terms for gold, the radiant energy of the Aten, Atenit, the sun, is the golden force which animates our physical and spirit bodies for vitality, healing, and rejuvenation. Noob Nubit is a metal. Gold is a metal which never corrodes. The solar energy animating our spirit bodies transmitted and regulated by the Abosom, the divinities Ra and Het Heru, is the root of this purity. That divine living energy animating us 
is that golden energy, just like you have gold in the soil. And that gold is, is preserved by the divinity, Sikar, Sekar, and so forth. But that gold is inside the black soil and so forth in the same fashion, that divine living energy of Ron Riot that enters into our system when we take in a deep breath and that fire energy within the breath, that life force energy, that solar energy that's moving within our bodies in the quote-unquote underworld, in the flesh, in the darkness, that is the golden energy, the radiant energy moving within that uh, black substance within us. It's animating our spirit body. It's transmitted and regulated by Ra and Heheru. It's the foundation of the purity, not only of the physical manifestation, which is gold, which never corrodes, but the spiritual root is the divine living energy of the Ba and the Ba at the spirit. As we approach the Atem Atemet or the autumn equinox, the end of the harvest cycle and the beginning of the seeding cycle, and the beginning of the seeding cycle, once again, is our new year, we engage in ritual purification. This includes the harvesting of the principal values of Afrakania, African manhood, and Afrakaitni womanhood. We go through this cycle of seeding, and then germinating and rooting, and then sprouting, and then the full flowering of the plant and the crops and so forth, and that takes place you know, the summer solstice, the full flowering, and then you move into the harvest phase, moving toward the equinox, um, fall equinox, when you harvest the fruits of your labor and utilize that, you know, those fruits and crops and so forth for your energy, for your empowerment, and so forth, and sustenance for yourself and for the community. And that includes the work that you have been doing, the work that you have seeded, that has germinated and rooted, that has sprouted and fully flowered, and then you utilize the energy that you put into that work to properly and um, effectively benefit the community. So we go through that yearly cycle, just like the plant cycle, um, and this is what's taking place. So at the end of the harvest cycle, but at, at the same time that is the beginning of the seeding cycle, it is a time for purification, ritual purification. And so we're coming to the end of a cycle and we're having this noob, new beat, um, retreat, training, cultural and ritual retreat. On one hand, because at the end of the cycle, it is a good time to take advantage of the shift in energy that's taking place on the planet. There's a shift, and especially people who are living in areas like Chicago and other places, Washington, D.C., or New York, or other places where the seasons shift markedly, going from the wintertime where it's freezing and snowing and so forth, summertime is very hot, so we can tell that shift in energy that's coming towards the balancing point and we're moving from the warm cycle through the balancing point and moving into the cool cycle, which is the introverted cycle with the seeding and the germinating and the rooting and so forth. We're moving to that cycle. So we want to move into that cycle, that seeding cycle. We want to rejuvenate ourselves and purify ourselves. So we go through that process, take advantage of the shift in energy that's taking place on the planet and utilize that to our best benefit. Just like we util- when it rains, we take that, that rain water and utilize it for our best benefit. When the sun is out, radiant and so forth, we take that sunlight, utilize that energy for our best benefit. When there's a shift in energy because of the cycles of the planet, we utilize that shift for our best benefit. So the terms noob and nubit. And before we, even before we get to that, we also want to say, so one, on one hand, it's the cycle that we're taking advantage of, the shift in energy, the tangible shift in energy, and we make uh, good use of that. But then we also, as we said, we had on the East Coast, we're a major port of our people entering into the United States, South Carolina, the Gullah Islands, going to that ancestral region. Then in the South, New Orleans, near the Gulf, another port, energy moving through that port, our ancestresses and ancestors' energy moving through that port still there in that space. We're going to that region to take advantage of that and harmonize with that energy. And now in the West, on the West Coast, and our people on the West Coast and in that region and so forth, they'll be able to benefit from that as well. And we will benefit from that as well. I'm going to get into the true story of that. So 
the terms noob and newbie are also descriptive titles of Ra and Heteru, respectively. You show an image of a falcon. The falcon animal totem is on the head of Heteru, and her name literally means Het, or house of Het, the falcon. So you see the falcon on her head, and the falcon as the head animal totem of Ra, Ra often being shown as the body of a man and the uh, head of, uh, of, a, of a falcon with a solar disc and a serpent uh, surmounting that solar disc upon its head and so forth. So when functioning as Nubit and Nub, Heteru, and Ra, referencing the setting of the Aten, Atenit, the sun, in the west, and it's entering the underworld, the spirit realm, for illumination purification, and the rejuvenation of the body and spirit. And, of course, we show the red-tailed hawk carries this totemic energy in our ancestral clans in North America as well as the falcon. So even when we're not in areas where we're interfaced with falcons and that specific animal totem that carries that energy, that red-tailed hawk carries the same energy as well in North America for our people within our clans. Now, so we're talking about the setting sun in the west, the land of the setting sun. Het Heteru also has the title Min Minit, Amin Miniwa Inakan or Ama Inakan, and Nebit Amintet, meaning the great mistress or master of the west. So what is it talking about with Het Heteru being the master or mistress of the west, the land of the setting sun? In ancient Kemet, you'll see the the great female Abosom, goddess Newt, bent over the earth. Her body makes the canopy of the sky, the atmosphere. You see the stars in her body and so forth. They'll show that Newt gives birth to the sun in the east. And then she swallows the sun in the west, and then it goes into the underworld and so forth. So when the sun goes into the underworld, it sets and goes, quote-unquote, underground, that solar energy, that um, divine living energy, that firepower and so forth, that radiant energy is now going down into the blackness and moving in the underworld in the 12 hours of night, illuminating those who are in the underworld, the ancestresses and ancestors of good character, sacred character and so forth. You have both of them, the divinities who empower the spirit realm and so forth under the earth and so forth, all of these things are taking place. When we receive divine living energy through the breath and through the ritual process, getting inside of our bodies, we can regulate the flow of that energy. We can heal ourselves when we amplify that energy through ritual practice. We can rejuvenate ourselves when we amplify that energy through ritual practice, ritual song, ritual dance, ritual drumming, ritual meditation, ritual incantations and so forth ritual offering, libation, the different things that we engage in, drumming and so forth, we receive the energy of Ran Rayat, we process it, and we transmit it. We utilize it for healing. We utilize it for our edification, for our empowerment. We utilize it for our rejuvenation so that we can be strengthen ourselves, preserve ourselves, perpetuate ourselves. So that reception of the uh, setting sun in the West, the West is called Amentet, and Heteru is called Nebet Amentet. You'll see in the Runu Pert in Heru that Het Heru takes the form of a sacred cow, and she's emerging from the Western mountain range, and she's receiving the setting sun. And when she receives the setting sun and receives that solar energy, she draws that solar energy into her being and draws it into the underworld and so forth and processes that and gestates it. So, when you look, for example, Het Heru governing the vulva and also governing the fallopian tubes, when the sperm cell enters into the female during the copulation process, through the vulva, the reception of that, not only the cell, but the solar energy animating that cell and so forth, going into the fallopian tubes, connecting with the um, you know, the ovum, and then a fusion takes place. There's a fusion of complementary opposites, the fusion of the sperm cell and ovum, creating a zygote and so forth. 
that takes place within the fallopian tubes. That is the sanctuary of Heheru. That is the het head or the house, the het, the sanctuary or the shrine of the head of the falcon of that energy that's flying through that area to penetrate that ovum and so forth. So that takes place and then eventually there's an implantation and then gestation begins to take place. Heheru receives, she captures, and then she gestates. You'll see her name spelled with the the sanctuary, the house or the shrine, and then the falcon inside the shrine. She's captured and receives that energy, that solar energy of that solar bird, and then begins to gestate that internally. She fuses together complementary opposites. She fuses together the Aparakani man and Aparakani woman, draws us together. She's a sensual um, energy that deals with the precursor to procreative activity and the replenishment of its harmony. She draws us together, fuses us together as complementary opposites, fuses us together physically, fuses together the sperm and ovum, and that process leads to gestation. She begins the gestation process. When the earth receives the solar energy of the solar disk in the west, and it sets in the west and penetrates the west and goes down deep into the blackness and so forth, as akin to that seed going into the womb of the female and so forth, and the gestation is taking place. There's illumination that takes place. There's vitality and energy and rejuvenation for the Aparakani male as well as Aparakani female, and eventually the child that will be conceived and born. All of this is taking place within that quote-unquote underworld until 40 weeks later the baby is born and emerges from the womb, and that's akin to uh, sunrise and so forth, and the spring equinox, the sprouting piece. So, Heteru, the mistress of the West, she emerges from the Western mountain range. She receives the solar energy, the solar seed, and so forth, takes that on the inside, and then rejuvenates. We want to take this setting energy at the end of our year towards the Atem Atemet equinox, the setting sun. We want to receive that solar energy, bring it into our being, gestate it, so we can rejuvenate ourselves and prepare ourselves for the coming new year, which, of course, for us is September 23rd. But part of that process, before the new year starts and before we go into that process, we have a seven-day new year cycle and so forth, and it's called Ojida and purification. But before we get into that and move into the new cycle, we're going to end this warming cycle. We want to rejuvenate ourselves, empower ourselves, and utilize what we have worked on and what we've built and so forth to edify the community. We want to engage this ritual process, but also that training process in Aparakani manhood, Aparakani womanhood, incorporating these seven principal values of manhood and womanhood so we can establish strong foundation for Amani nationism, Amani Sesu nation building restoration. So that's that cosmological foundation when we read the Runu Pert M. Heru. Uh, chapter 186, you see an image of Het Heru. She's in the form of the sacred cow emerging from the western mountain range. The text says, Het Heru, lady of the west or mistress of the west, Nebet Amentet, she of the west, lady of the sacred land, the eye of Ra, Arit Ra, or the eye of Ra, which is on his forehead, kindly of countenance in the bark of eternity a resting place for him who has done right within the boat of the blessed, who built the great bark for Alsar in order to cross the water of truth. She receives those who are setting in the west. The first, as we mentioned before, the first spirit that's placed in the valley of the deceased when someone makes their transition, sun setting is akin to someone making their transition, going to the west, the land of the ancestors is an ancestor's when the spirit separates from the body of the first divinity, you confront its head heru emerging from that um, western mountain range, the divinity of beauty, divine harmony, manifest, that's what beauty is. So even though there is some tension, some melancholy and so forth associated with transition, with death, separating from the earthly family and so forth and going to the ancestral realm, the first recalibration you receive is confronting the spirit, the deity, the goddess, the abosom, orisha vodou, the ntorot of divine beauty. 
divine harmony manifests. When you look at divine order, it manifests as harmony. If you see something harmonious, according to divine order, that's a manifestation of divine order, and beauty is a revelation of that harmony. So Heheru, as the divinity of beauty, pulling together complementary opposites in a harmonious fashion, she establishes order and reveals order through harmony. That's what beauty is. And she constantly replenishes that revelation of order through harmony. That's what pleasure is. So she pulls those things together. So even when you make transition, deceased, going through the ancestral realm, you confront the divinity of divine beauty. Her energy allows you to recalibrate yourself and get back in harmony with divine order to manifest beauty and recognize the transition is a movement into another phase of existence with the ancestral community. So she's the first one that you receive or you come in contact with, and that is a quote-unquote blessing or mercy to us from Ra and Ra. But she's also called the Eye of Ra. The term Eye is Ari or Ani, Energy Kemet, Ani or Ani in Akan. Of course, it's the Eye, you know, the window to the Ka, Kaet, the soul and so forth. But Ari also means to make, to do, to, to uh, work and so forth. It means to watch and to see, but it also means to make, to do, to work. She's the one that works the energy of Ra as well as Rayat for ingesting, for gestation, to make things happen. A person can conceive a child, but then they have to gestate so the child can grow and develop and unfold and so forth. We receive energy, but it must be gestated and must be gestated harmoniously so it can grow and develop and we can utilize it for our best benefit. So when we receive information, receive direction, receive cultural information and all these different things that sound beautiful and sound deep and sound whatever, it's all meaningless if you can't tangibly take what you receive and utilize it to empower and educate our people and defend our people so we can engage the nation building process. If it can't be applied to nation building, nation restoration, then it's useless. Then that pseudo beauty is not beauty at all. So she receives, but then she also gestates. And when she gestates that divine living energy, it can be used to empower us, to heal us, and so forth. This happens in the quote unquote West. Now, California is the extreme west of the Western Hemisphere. One of the reasons we need to go to that region, the Western region of the body of Asase Afu, the Fertile Earth Mother. This is a region where numerous Afurakanu, Afurakainu Africans migrated in the effort to liberate themselves from enslavement. But there was slavery in California as well. During the gold rush of 12,849 of so-called 1849, some of our ancestresses and ancestors settled in the region and established gold mining settlements, discovering gold and building independent towns for themselves. One of these ancestral enclaves was the settlement known as, quote-unquote, Negro Bar, which is located in Folsom, California. The nearby Negro Bar State Park is named after this original settlement. It is to this region that we make an ancestral return for our final retreat of our year of 13,018 for purification. It is a time for Ojida Main, the purified nation, to become the rejuvenated nation. So we're going through this. During this retreat, we go from the purified nation to the rejuvenated nation, the nation that rejuvenates itself so that when we come back out of this training, culture, and ritual period, we take the information that we have rejuvenated ourselves with and empower our community, empower entrepreneurship, empower development, empower training institutions, educational institutions, ritual institutions, cultural institutions, and so forth, wherever we are, wherever locale we come from. This is why we say our training retreat is for those who will become facilitators of Obedima and Obayatai, trainings in their communities grounded in ancestral religious practice. Obedima, Afurakani manhood, and Obayatai, 
Afro-Akaini womanhood trainings are designed to be conducted in seven one-hour sessions for seven weeks based upon the seven chapters of each book. These books and trainings are a philosophical basis for rites of passage for youth and adults. The restoration of Afro-Akaini manhood and Afro-Akaini womanhood rooted in our ancestral religious values is key to the restoration of Ojirama and the purified nation Afro-Akaini, Afro-Akaini people in the Western Hemisphere. This is a funda- foundational and fundamental element of Amaniye Afro-Akaini, Afro-Akaini or African Black nationism, the purification of nationalism for grounded Afro-Akaini, Afro-Akaini men and women form strong marriages, raise strong children, and build strong families. The cornerstone of the Afurakani, Afurakani African Oman, the African nation. All Afurakani, Afurakani people must be grounded in these principles. So that is the purpose of what we're doing. So when we get to the retreat, of course, where we have it laid out here on the website, we'll have the um, joint session of Pata Sasa Tim, which is a three hour training, it's an educational curriculum grounding our people in our culture. Um, and then we have the breakout sessions, Afurakani Manhood, which I will be conducting with the brothers, um, Ama Asase Ajay. She will be conducting the Obaatai Afurakani Womanhood uh, training with the sisters based on the book and so forth. So this is what we'll be getting into. We want to get into some more, however, truthery with regard to this region and this establishment of this, what has become an ancestral enclave, a place of ancestral return for our people in California. Many people are unaware of the history or the true story of enslavement in California. So we can, if you begin to study that and look that information up, you'll find a number of different places um, online where they go into some detail with regard to this notion of enslavement in California. Some people assume that California has always been liberal. It's not liberal now. It has never been liberal for our people. They believe it's some kind of uh, oasis of some nonsense, and there's not much racism. Of course, our people understand better. But when you go back to some of these, uh, you know, situations and conditions that our people found ourselves in, when we were forced to migrate there, some of our people migrated willingly, some of our people were forced to migrate, then you can see the trajectory of how things um, manifest as they are today. The same police brutality and everything that's taking place in California now, you can look back to the enslavement period and you'll find it has a root there. Now, just give me some basic information the defeat of Mexico in 1847, California and other Mexican territories were ceded to U.S. rule. That's the Mexican cession under the terms of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the war. At the time, the 26-state nation was divided equally between 13 free states and 13 so-called slave states. With the addition of vast new agricultural re- agriculturally uh, rich territories, including California, the debate over slavery intensified dramatically. So California was divided. Some wanted it to enter the union as a quote unquote slave state. Some wanted it to enter the union as a free state. Although California entered the union as a free state, the framers of the state constitution wrote into law the system or systematic denial of suffrage and other civil rights to non-white citizens, some authorities went so far as to attempt to deny entry of all, quote-unquote, African Americans free and, quote-unquote, slave to California. They didn't want any black people in the entire state, free or enslaved. They were like, this is our new state. We don't want any black people anywhere in the state at all. The legislature passed a bill that would ban the immigration of free blacks to California. The state senator, David C. Broderick, a fierce opponent of slavery and former firefighter from San Francisco, managed to kill the bill through parliamentary maneuver. But the, some of them didn't want enslavement because they didn't want an influx of black people as enslaved black people in the state. 
it wasn't that they didn't want enslavement because they thought it was moral, morally reprehensible. They didn't want a bunch of black people in their new state. That's what was going on. So the slavery did persist in California, even without legal authority. Some so-called slave owners simply refused to notify their enslaved population of the prohibition against enslavement in the state. And they continued to trade our people as slaves within the state. Numerous state trials ruled in the favor of emancipation once people found out and so forth. But once again, it, it must be clear, even though there was a split between some people wanted slavery in the state, some people didn't, it was because some people just didn't want to include black people in the state, period. Others wanted to put up with it because they wanted us to work, you know, the lands and so forth and generate a great deal of wealth for them. So they would put up with it if they, it would generate them wealth. But, so, but they wanted then, you know, enslaved population, there were others who just would rather not go through with that and have to deal with that and just, instead of enslaving the people, just keep them out totally. Either way, it was torturous for our people. What happened was gold was discovered. And because gold was discovered and it was a new territory, then people began to flock by the thousands to California to try to become wealthy. Thousands and thousands of people began to flock. Some of our people went in that direction. Some of our people who were already free, Afurakani, Afurakani people who had purchased their freedom or attained their freedom and so forth, further east, some of them migrated out. Some of our people escaped from enslavement and went West and so forth to try to find out if they could get something going. Some of our people were drugged to California by their Mississippi and, and Alabama and other so-called slave owners forced to work in the mines. But then once they got there, some of our people escaped and so forth and set up their independent territories as well. And then they have a list of some of these cases. Um, about people who were enslaved during the time. They passed fugitive slave laws in Sacramento and all these different things. So a lot of this is going on. It's no different than what was going on around the country. Now, we want to get to this the place that we're talking about. The discovery of gold by James Marshall at Sutter's Mill in Coloma in January 1848 was at first meant to be a secret known only to a few. However, within six months, word of Marshall's discovery and subsequent gold discoveries in the Sierra foothills were leaked to the public, and a human rush of unimagined proportions was triggered to the gold fields of California. By the end of 1848, over 10,000 miners from California, Oregon, Hawaii, and Mexico had begun mining in the Sierra foothills. By the summer of 1849, over 40,000 migrants would make their way to California's gold fields by ship, wagon, horseback, or on foot. These quote-unquote 49ers came from many parts of the United States and the rest of the world and made California one of the first uh, quote-unquote multicultural locations in the world at the time simply because people trying to get rich. Our people, Afrakani, Afrakani people in America, quote-unquote African-Americans, were among the many immigrants coming to California at, at that time. One of the earliest recorded locations mined by African-American, Afrakani, Afrakani people in America, gold miners, was on, quote-unquote, Negro Bar, which they originally called Nigger Bar, but Negro Bar a large sandbar located on the south bank of the Lower American River in what is now the city of Folsom. The site received its name because of a small number of African Americans who were reputed to be the first to mine the area in late 1849. This is the place where we're going to have our retreat, quote unquote Negro Bar. This is the region of Folsom, California. A February 9, 1850 newspaper article in the Sacramento Place of Times describes the diggings at Negro Bar as being located about four miles below Mormon Island on the American River. The article later goes on to say some colored gentlemen discovered them 
gentlemen, just from these diggings, inform us that one to two ounces of gold to each man is the average per day. Most African-American miners were to leave Negro Bar by 1852. They eventually moved to other nearby gold fields, such as, quote, unquote, Negro Hill, Little Negro Hill, Negro Flat, and Massachusetts Flat, and they go into some more de definitions there. If you look on our website, we have an image from that time period of some of our ancestresses and ancestors standing there at Negro Bar in the late, quote, unquote, 1800s. This is the area we're going to. They were going to the west, the extreme west, the land of the setting sun, the land governed by Nebit Amentet, the mistress of the west, who received that energy of Ra, that solar energy and so forth, received in the western region, capturing that solar energy, moving through the underworld, that gold energy, that sacred, uncorrosive, non-corrosive metal and so forth, they're going to use that non-corrosive metal for their empowerment, for their economic empowerment, but also, of course, for our people. In many of the shrines of the Abosom, the divinities, gold is a major part of the shrine. That non-corrosive metal is a solar metal. It's connected to those solar divinities and is utilized ritual. This is why you see Afurakani, Afurakani people wearing gold, kings, queen, mothers, draped in gold, and so forth, in ancient Kani and Kemet, Nubia's golden land, and so forth. The term Nubit is a title of northern Nubia and so forth. At certain times in ancient Kemet, the people, Nubian people being called the golden people and so forth. Whether you look in west, central, south, north, Afraka, Afraka, east, all the way into north, central, south America, the Caribbean, and Europe, wherever black people are, we're wearing a great deal of gold and still trying to access that gold and so forth. Part of it has to do with seeking something to do with wealth, but a great deal of it, that attraction we have to gold is not just because it's shiny and we like the way it looks, but we've always utilized gold, that non-corrosive metal. It is a means by which we communicate with the Nananom and Samanfu and the Abosom, our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors and the deities. It's a ritual no different than gems and other metals and colors and scents and so forth. It's a receptor and transmitter of divine living energy, specifically the energy of the Ba and the Ba'at, your spirit, the divine living energy, the child of Ra and Ra dwelling within you. We did a whole couple of broadcasts, a few broadcasts on the Ba and the Ba'at, but it's a solar fire energetic um, force within you, that divine living energy within you and that gold is a, a conductor a, and a transducer of that energy of the divine flame within you. We talked about the twin flame, the Ba, ba T, and so forth in the previous broadcast. But the Ba and Ba is the divine living energy shown as a bird, but a, bowling, a burning bowl of incense in front of the bird. That's the animate fire within you. The wings of the bird is the animation and the fire from the flame of the burning incense and so forth, representing that animate fire. That is that golden, fiery energy that gives you vitality, life, and it can be amplified for your healing, amplified through ritual practice for rejuvenation, amplified for your own spiritual empowerment, your own conscious empowerment to unlock knowledge of things in nature, nature creation within your consciousness and so forth. This is how we're able to attune to the forces in creation, attune to plant life, animal life, and mineral life when we amplify the energy of our Ba and by it, the divine living energy within us, link that amplified energy to the amplified energy of the spirit within plant life, animal life, and mineral, mineral life and make an energy connection. And through that energy connection we make with them when we amplify our energy of our spirits to them, then spirit possession can take place, spirit communication can take place. We can learn the nature and function of the spirits of plant life, animal life, and mineral life and their medicinal properties and so forth. We can learn the nature and function of the deities. We can become possessed by the ancestresses and ancestors and the deities. We can learn their role in creation, their role in our bodies. We can heal ourselves. We can empower ourselves, establish sound structures, educational structures, governmental structures, military structures, and so forth with the proper ideas 
all of that takes place when we fuse together ritual practice spirituality with our educational process. So this is why we're going to the region. This is why we're going to the West, the land of the setting sun, to access that ancestral enclave, to pay, pay homage to our ancestresses and ancestors in that region of the Earth Mother's body, in that region of Asase Afua and Asase Yah, the two Earth Mother divinities. We're going there for their rejuvenation peace and also to connect with our people in the West. We've connected with our people um, for that training piece um, on Edisto Island, on the East Coast, connected with our people in the South, in the central, South, central part of the country. Now we get a chance to connect with our people who want to go to that training piece in the West, who may not have been able to travel all the way to South Carolina if they're in California. I haven't been able to travel to you know, Louisiana and so forth, or they just weren't able to, didn't have the time to be able to connect in that fashion, but would like to go through that training piece on Obedima Afrakani manhood, Obatai and Afrakani womanhood, as well as Patasa Sitem, as well as the ritual piece. We'll have ancestor ritual as well. So um, to connect with our people in the West so we can, we have crossed the entire country. We've linked these different um, ancestral sacred areas where we engage that ancestral return, ancestral pilgrimages, and so forth to these sacred sites of our ancestral religion and culture. We have sacred sites where we have been living for hundreds of years. We don't have to get up and go somewhere else and say there are sacred sites over there. Wherever our people died and were buried and their blood entered into the soil, their bodies are in the womb of the Earth Mother and so forth, that makes that region of the Earth Mother's body especially sacred to us, to our clans, because our ancestresses and ancestors are in those re- in those areas, in those in that, that region of Earth. So it's it's uh, sacred for us specifically, and because of the things that we accomplished in these areas. Um, there's just one more piece on the site. And if you have any questions on the phone line, you can hit the number one. If you have any questions um, uh, in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact. We just want to go over uh, a couple more things on the new page. And we're, we're going to add some more information on the page. But we just posted the page today. So you see up under the uh, description and so forth, you'll see that um, so it also says vegan food, ritual, culture, vegan meals provided for breakfast and lunch on Miminidina, Wusida, Saturday and Sunday. Participants will have the option of touring Negro Bar State Park right in the area where our people first established that mining settlement and so forth and learn about the true history of the migration and settlements of our ancestresses and ancestors. So the way we do our retreats, we have they're all-day sessions, so we start off in the morning. We have breakfast, like at 9 a.m. and so forth. Um, then we start our first session, the three-hour session, uh, the Patasasa Tim session, and then we have, you know, the um, we have a break, break for lunch. Then we have the session, the breakout sessions for Obedima and Obaya time in the afternoon, and that's a couple of hours as well. And then by late afternoon then we're complete for that day as far as the training from like nine till about four or so, something like that. That's the entire day. After that, then people have free time because of course you are, it's a retreat and training cultural and ritual retreat and so forth, but it's also at the same time um, a vacation for you so you can explore the area. You have that option. You don't, you're not stuck in a group where you have to follow everybody to different places and so forth. Once the sessions are over, you have the freedom to do whatever you want to do for the rest of the evening and so forth. You can go out. You can go to Negro Bar State Park or you can go to some other areas of interest and learn about the ancestral culture of those areas. And then the second day is very similar, but we will have ancestral ritual along the river and so forth, ritual offerings and so forth, communicating with our insomapo not on Oman Samapo and the Yabosom. Of course, we have breakfast, but then we have the ritual peace um, um, 
going to lunch, then having the session in the afternoon. And we, we talk about that specific session um, on the website. We're going to get into some, some more detail about that as time goes on. We'll have, we have the basic itinerary already laid out on the website for this particular sec, um, two hour session. Once again, this is a joint session. So the Tata Timmons is a joint session. The Obediman Obatai sessions are breakout sessions um, where men, males and females, men and women are separated um, to focus on you know, those pieces, and then we come back together for the joint session. This other session is another joint session. We'll be dealing with the nature of the Ba, Ba as the spirit, which is called Obra, and Obra in a Hudu, Akan tradition, and the ritual implications of ritual, um, ritual implications of cleansing, internal, herbal, and spiritual for development of Afro-Akani manhood and Afro-Akani womanhood. So that'll be, of course, myself and Ama Asase Ajay, with that joint session there. Now, you'll see the basic itinerary. We're going to give some more details later. Um, once again, this, our retreats are smaller, so we only register up to 25 people at a retreat. When you have a smaller retreat like that, then you can go in-depth on the subject matter um, when people have questions, you can go in depth and answer questions in detail, and people can, you know, share and exchange information, ideas, and so forth, um, you know, in a very, very thorough fashion. So that's why we keep them to like 25 people, small, uh, smaller group. So the registration, first come, first serve. Um, when you scroll up on the website. The registration fee is $150. There's an installment payment, payment option available if you would like to take advantage of that. The registration fee includes the trainings. It includes the vegan meals. It includes the soft cover books. You'll receive three different books, the books for each session. Because we have the Pilates of Tim Oberema Obatai, as well as another book that will be um, given out at the session. So you, the, all, all the trainings for both days, you know, eight hours um, and a little bit less than eight hours the second day, but eight hours the first day or close to eight hours the first day. The training, the vegan meals for both days, as well as the soft cover books for each session. Um, so that's with the 150 covers. Um, and then married couples receive a 50% discount on registration. So it's 150 for both of you all as opposed to 150 each for married couples. Of course, we promote you know, marriage, this is the key is, you know, we're dealing with Obedima and Obatai, Afrikani manhood, Afrikani womanhood. So, of course, the purpose of building strong men and women is for the purpose of strong marriages and strong families, and that's the foundation for a strong, for a strong Omaina nation. So, married couples um, receive a 50% discount. Uh, attendees are responsible for your own lodging. What we're going to do is the same thing we did in South Carolina on Edisto Island. We'll have like the, uh, a large beach house, which is private, which this, that's where the um, sessions will take place. Um, but when we've looked in the Folsom area, Folsom, California, you can go on, um, you know, the basic websites, and you'll see that just a few miles away, like five miles away or four miles away or two miles away, you'll see there are a few hotels. There's a La Quinta there's a Hampton Inns, there's those kind of hotels, and then they have their other hotels that are, you know, not the more popular ones. Some of them are less expensive, some of them are more. We've seen some for like 60 some dollars a night or something like that. Um, some people are, when we, we're going to put a group together, and we even have just even in the notification. Um, in the notification piece, um, that we're going to put up on Facebook, the event notification for the, for the uh, piece. When you're posting in that group and people join the group or join the notification and so forth, you can put the information out just like we did in Edisto Island. The people who wanted to room with other people who, just for those couple of days so that you can split the cost of the lodging. So if the lodging was 60 or $70 a night for a room and you, you split it, a couple of sisters got together, um, and split it, then you're only paying $35 a night for a room. Um, there are some places that, you know, you could rent a, a condo or, you know, 
like an Airbnb kind of thing or a vacation rental by owner kind of thing, and you can uh, sometimes, you know, four people sleeping to a room or, or, or renting out a, a beach house or a house along the river or just a house not too far, a couple of miles away. You know, four, we did that in Esto Island, people, four or five people renting a house together, and that way the, you know, the cost for each person may have been $30 a night instead of $50 a night or $70 a night individually. So that it, it can be very economical if you want to do that. You don't have to do that, but that is an option. And when you get into the group, when we post the event notification, just throw your name out there and say, I'm one of the people who's willing to um, share, and then other people will chime in, you exchange information, and boom, you have it. So that greatly cuts on the price. So as we said, registration is first come, first serve. We can't hold spaces for people. Um, and we've talked about that before. Sometimes people will say, hey, I'm coming, just you know, hold the space for me. And then other people are turned away because there are no spaces left. And then the people said they were coming, end up, ended up not coming, and they just wanted a, whole, a space held for them without making a deposit. And then, you know, people miss out. So only people who make a deposit, the space will be held. You can make the entire deposit, 150 so you can get your deposit out of the way. We also have the option of a 50% um, deposit, so you can make a deposit of 75 and then, you know, a few weeks later, you can pay the other 75 So that's on the website. When you go to the website, you will see the different options. Um, hold on one second. Okay. You'll see the different options on the website we just posted. So you can do that. We're going to put the event notification. We'll also create a group specifically for the event. We'll be posting new information in there. We're going to be posting uh, information with regard to, you know, the not only the accommodations, but also, you know, the uh, cultural information in Folsom. Most people know about Folsom, California, if you heard of it because of the prison in Folsom. But most people don't know about, quote, unquote, unless they're from the area, Negro Bar, where our people, black people, went there, established a uh, mining settlement and began mining gold and connecting with the divinities of earth that govern gold, like Sekar, Saka, Sakara. He governs, he's a divine goldsmith and so forth. He regulates that flow of golden or solar energy in the underworld. Of course, Heheru, as we said, just states that energy. So car regulates his flow throughout the 12 hours of the night, quote unquote, and that flow throughout our bodies and so forth. Um, Ra and Riot provide that solar energy, that divine living energy that animates us. So our people connecting with the earth mother divinities, connecting with the divinities that govern that gold for their own empowerment, for, for their own healing, utilize that metal on our bodies for healing purposes, also for other ritual purposes, for communication with the ancestors and ancestors and the Abosom and other Afrakani, Afrakani people. So there are a number of different ritual uses. We're going to get into all of that for medicine as well. Gold is medicinal as well. So we're going to get into all of that kind of information. That'll be part of the presentation on the second day when we're talking about herbal internal medicine and, and ritual and cleansing and so forth. Um, and we'll be out there at the river where our people were actually standing, where they were mining that gold and so forth. So all that will be taking place. So we're going to set up a group. You'll get that detailed information there. But the, the website is set up. We just completed the website, the web page for that. You can go right now. You can make your deposit, whether it's the 50% or 100% deposit, it's up to you. Um, and you can, we'll post that information. We just created a page on Facebook, meaning a, a Facebook quote unquote business page or community page for the retreat. Um, please go to that page and click the invite friends um, function, invite your friends from your friends list on the page. The way they have it now is different. It used to be where you, if you wanted to invite somebody, you had to click each name, invite for each name. And if you had thousands of people, you have to click thousands of times to invite people, which was foolish. Now what they have is you can just click the button that says select all, and it will select your entire list. And then you just hit one button, and it selects everybody at the same time. Sometimes you have to go back because it will say select all, but it will select half of your people. Then you go back 
click collect um click select all again and it'll select you know the other half but that way we can get people um aware of the information some of the people who are not able to make it to South Carolina they weren't able to make it to um New Orleans they're not able to make it to Jamaica in November but they still want to connect they still want to you know connect or they may live in the area live in California or nearby in you know Nevada or other places not too far we want to drive up or fly out and so forth so if you weren't able to make it this is the final piece this is the final retreat of our year of 13,018 we have 25 spaces because it's um, some of the people in the area some people will just drive up they won't have to fly out so it'll be less expensive for them and so forth and some people from the West, since we've never presented in California, we've presented, you know, in different places all across the country, but California is actually one place that we've not yet presented. This will be the first time we're visiting. But, of course, we will be visiting later with our film and in a number of places in California, Oakland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, different places. But this will be the first time that we connect in that fashion. So some people have been asking for us to come out, so we anticipate that, you know, the spaces will be taken up quickly, especially for the people who are out there in the West, because we haven't been to the West yet. This is the first time. So if you would like to attend, go to the site as soon as possible. They are first come, first serve. So what we're going to do now, we, this particular broadcast is um, we just wanted to announce that and give the philosophical foundation for uh, the retreat. and myself and Ama Asase Ajay, who has spoken at all three of our Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation festivals in October. She has her site, hoodooomb.com. She has her business, Asase Hills. Ama procures medicine from plant life and mineral life, communicating with the spirits, plant life and mineral life, and so forth, crafting, you know, these medicinal tinctures and salves and so forth. This is ancestrally inherited ritual practice and so forth for the healing of our people. Um, she's talked about that. She has her body butters and her soaps and her um, the system Happy Cat, which is a cleansing system for you know feminine cleansing and so forth, which is a very powerful product. Um, a number of different things. When you go to hoodooomb.com, Amma has been on our broadcast before, so we are happy. And she's one of the Ojina mine. Um, Ma Tainfo, which is the group of sisters, women in Ojiramai, the purified nation. Of course, Obatain means woman. Ma Tainfo is women in the plural. Um, she's one of the Ojiramai, Ma Tainfo, one of the 14 sisters who uh, contributed to the development of the Obatain Afuraikadi Womanhood book. Well, I scribed the book. It was through the uh, information and influence and um, direction of the 14 different sisters who made this book happen. So she's one of those sisters. So we look forward to connecting once again. She was at the retreat in South Carolina, at Edisto Island. Um, so we look forward to uh, connecting once again and empowering the community. So. If you have any questions, just uh, hit us up on Facebook or on the new page. Like the new page on Facebook. Join the event notification, which we're about to post. Uh, go and make your reservation. If you have any questions, send us an email. So we just wanted to announce that tonight. So yet I say we thank you for tuning into the broadcast. And Yebeshi Abio, we will meet again. Good job.